Clerk, we'll go ahead and start this meeting. And uh, we have one uh, general comment card, and uh, I would like to go ahead and hear, hear that first. It's on item two, I believe. Is, it, well, it says general comment. Oh, okay, it's item two. Okay. All right, then we'll, we'll hold off, sir. We'll hold off since it is item two, and we're, we're going to... Oh, here more. Okay, here we go. More so two, two. Okay, here we go. All right, Mr. Labonge, I am going to suggest that we um, recommend uh, items three through six for consent. Great. And we're going to uh, move forward with item two first. Uh, and we are ready. Also, would you note, too, that uh, the, the Department of Cultural Affairs has been most aggressive in a positive way on getting grants. More and more work I see they do going after grants, so we should note that as we go, when it goes to council, they're good work at aggressively going after and getting grants. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. Item number two, motion, LaVange Fuentes, relative to instructing the Department of Recreation and Parks to study and report on current challenges facing the Los Angeles Park Ranger Program. Thank you. And we are joined by our colleague, Mr. Curran Price. Uh, and we are going to uh, hear item two. And we are going to bring forward uh, Kevin Regan. Thank you. Uh, and we will also uh, bring someone from the CAO's office. Do we have? No? Okay. Uh, we'll hear from, from Mr. Regan. Thank you. Well, good afternoon, Council Members. Kevin Regan, Assistant General Manager with the Department of Recreation and Parks. Uh, just give you a real brief history of the Park Ranger Program uh, in relation to this motion. So at one time, the Department of Recreation and Parks had uh, quite an extensive number of park rangers, pushing as many as 70 uh, full-time authorities. Uh, but over the years, and due to a, a number of different consolidations, first was a consolidation. Uh, for everybody's benefit, there's a, a civil service term, whether they're authorized or resolution. Correct. There's a difference, correct? That's correct. So, so it, our problem was for the, you said up to 70 rangers? At one point in time, the department had roughly 70 full-time authorities for park rangers. But they were not protected in the budget every year. Is that correct? Um, no, I think you're, you may be referencing the 17 vacancies that we lost in a subsequent budget. No, with here. something, well, a few years ago we put in uh, members, uh, and this is very important, there's, there's authorized, I know Ms. Whalen, so I don't know if she's an expert on personnel back there, I know one Whalen is, but there's authorized or there's... Resolution. Resolution. Resolution means it's only... Re resolution authority is, a, is like a placeholder in the budget. It shows the position authority, but there's no budget behind it. There's and no money. Resolution behind. authority. And, and the other one, authorized is... Here. Well, if it's allocated, then it means that it's in the budget, it's allocated, and it's funded, and yeah. it's recurring every year. A resolution authority is an authority that has to be... Uh, reapplied for every year during the budget right. process. One year, just Mr. Chairman and members, I was very aggressive mm -hmm. in trying to get more rangers, and they were authorized. They were resolution. They were resolution authorities, which should have been another authority. And I did not know the civil service term, because mm -hmm. I'm not civil service, and then we lost them in the next budget. So what we've got, we've got to look for is something that Pete keeps it in there for good. Thank you. Sure. And, and to that point, uh, Mr. LeBonge, maybe Mr. Regan could tell us exactly what they need and, and articulate exactly how we need to word it so that we can have the authority to bring aboard more rangers. To get the count up. To get the count back up. But you haven't given your report yet, so I don't I want to... I had to interrupt him on that one point, so it's so key. Want, know know you before you go, about. Kevin, Kevin, Sir. stop for a second. Yes, Council. Olga Garay just came in. All your matters were approved. Tell her, Madam, uh, Mr. Chair. <laughs> So she knows. Oh, but, yeah. Yes. So she that, that all of her appointees yeah. were approved. I believe she probably realizes that, but we were very, very happy to approve the uh, uh, commissioners. Thank you. Thank and you. also the grants and that you do a great job on. We, we just waved those through by consent. Okay. And, and I also want to introduce our colleague, Gil Cedillo, who joined us. Uh, Mr. Regan, please. Kevin, thank you. So just to uh, continue real briefly, so the, uh, there was a number of uh, functional consolidations of operations that took place. The first was park rangers, 
uh, joining with Office of Public Safety. You've probably heard of the police for GSD, General Services Department, called they were called Office of Public Safety, OPS. Um, that took the bulk of our Ranger uh, forces into the Department of General Services and they became police officers. That lasted for a few years and just recently, within the last year, uh, the Office of Public Safety has now consolidated with LAPD. And so those Rangers, that, those folks that were one-time Rangers became General Services Police, have now become, uh, are in the process of becoming LAPD. Mm -hmm. So uh, what that did to the department, uh, those were, those were uh, functional decisions that the city, you know, the city family uh, made the decisions on. The department was in favor of those. However, it really left uh, Recreation and Parks with very few uh, Ranger authorities. And uh, I can give you just a quick breakdown. We have in the entire division 22 people. There's uh, one clerical person, 10 park rangers who are sworn uh, that are filled, and then we have two park ranger vacancies that are there, they would be sworn. We have five park ranger non-sworn. Those are like a naturalist ranger. They're still a park ranger, but they don't have the peace officer uh, arrest, powers of arrest. Um, we have two senior park rangers on duty those are supervisors and we have one vacancy and, and we have one senior park ranger too which is like a kind of a captain level so all in all 25 full-time including their their clerical person it's not a lot of uh you know people and not all of those are folks that would be doing all of the ranger duties so at any given time really we today we really just deploy within griffith park at one time the department had rangers throughout the entire park system mm -hmm. um throughout the is this if i may through the regional park system or throughout the park system at one point in time the department of recreation and parks staffed rangers throughout the entire park system mm -hmm. in neighborhood community parks as well as regional parks and then post consolidation with Office of Public Safety, we shrank to just regional parks, and today we're just mainly in Griffith Park, although we can deploy. How many, how many rangers? Excuse me. Uh, well, really, if you want to talk about people that are out there that do the actual day-to-day work, -day work, there's really 17. So down from a high of how many years ago? At the, at the, peak, at the peak, around 70. Mm -hmm. And this means zero park rangers in Elysian Park, Zero park rangers in Debs, zero at Hanson Dam, correct? That's correct, Councilman, for the most part, Spolita yes. Boulder Basin, Verdugo Mountains, uh, all of our regional parks, all the way down to San Pedro. Correct, Venice. Uh -huh. There's 10 regional parks. Mm -hmm. And then just real briefly, so you kind of know the things that the rangers do, um, park rangers uh, uniquely, a very unique class within the city of Los Angeles. They do uh, law enforcement, so they have, uh, they are, um, Peace officers in the state of California that post certification, they go through a police academy. Mm -hmm. They are also uh, firefighters, so they're they're completely trained and authorized to fight wildland fires, and they do have firefighting apparatus. They're also uh, many of them are EMT qualified, and all of them are first aid qualified, so they can do emergency medical response. Mm -hmm. Um, they also lead nature hikes and do a lot of naturalist and uh, types of activities. So really interesting class, a broad uh, spe spectrum of uh, responsibilities. Um, however, we just don't have many of them. So uh, it's, it's very difficult to um, cover all the shifts that are necessary, even in Griffith Park, believe it or not. So that's kind of where we are. Um, just for the record, Los Angeles Police Department is responsible for all the policing in the parks, and park rangers are really there as a, a supplement to them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I feel that what we've lost, especially in Elysian Park, which is shared by my colleague Gil Cedillo and myself, is at 600 acres of, of regional park, and we've lost the, uh, the attention uh, and, and the intimate knowledge that the rangers a ranger would have or an office of public safety would have had had they not been absorbed in the police department of where the the trouble spots are where the homeless encampment homeless encampments pop up uh, and i think that we've lost that knowledge which in turn makes people feel less safe in our parks uh, and so it, it's a, a great concern to me as as an elected official that we uh, work toward beefing up our park ranger uh, system again and put officers in our parks that know them best and that in turn will encourage more people to use our parks for all the right reasons um, so there's my little soapbox speech um, colleagues any questions or comments
Uh, I've got some more. If you, do we have mm -hmm. time with uh, you complete your report? Yes, Councilman, I'm complete. Yeah. Thank you. Well, the first thing I did want to say is uh, God bless Bill Eckert. He was the first ranger. Uh, Frank Padino uh, has already passed, but for, uh, Bill just died. Recently passed. Just recently died. He was a great ranger and was very involved. Originally, the rangers were Gardner takers. Their civil service class was pushed through by John Farrell, the late great councilman, years ago to create this position. And then it grew, and there's been dynamic changes. In coming to this meeting today, I looked and reflected on the history of uh, things that have happened here in the city and the biggest thing that has happened in the city is the Los Angeles Police Department is reaching their goal of 10,000 officers. They did that by transferring general services personnel to that. But that goal was originally set by then Mayor Richard Reardon, 10,000, and it worked through Mr. Hahn and Mr. Villaraigosa was able to finally do it. Mr. Garcetti wants to keep that. My request to the Department of Recreation and Parks and the CEO's office to do a study to determine what is the actual number we need. Whether it's 150, 125, whatever the number. You said 70. I don't really remember 70. But if they were part-timers too or were they all full-time 70? To my recollection, at one point the department had as many as 70 full-time authorities. I can, ch I mean. Yeah, I don't, I don't remember that. But anyway, it's all right, Kevin. We're okay with However, that. But you've got to give us a number on those him. positions I mean, as I you go I mean, forward. you got to come back and yeah, study absolutely. this. absolutely. And I'm, who's I'm the chief ranger? There is currently no chief. There's no chief ranger, which I think hurts our ability to point to someone to be the leader to move forward to be able to answer it. It is unfortunate that a lesion uh, doesn't benefit from a ranger. Uh, or uh, O'Melveny doesn't benefit for a ranger, or MacArthur Park doesn't. They're great representatives of the city as they go there. And also, I think they should be Gardner caretakers in a small way, too. Like, you know who Lassie was? I do know who you know what, the, you know what was that guy? Got the guy and what was the boy's name? Billy. Timmy. Timmy. And what did his dad do? He was a ranger. Right. He did conservation as well as enforcement. And we're never going to get our parks whipped into shape unless there's a little conservation along the way to help everybody. Because I feel for Gardner caretakers who come to work every day and have to pick up the trash, the trash, the trash. So just that little extra, some may, may help that as they do that. And I'll talk to you. But I would like to suggest as the maker of the motion that we ask the CAO and the Department of Recreation and Parks to determine what is the actual number. If you buy a piece of land right now at Beverly and Alvarado and you come up with three acres and you build a gymnasium on there, you will get through the CAO's office 15 people possibly assigned uh, because it's a building. There will be a park director, a park director two, a uh, head of seniors uh, outreach, head of children, on down the line including maintenance staff. But in our wildlife, an open space area, there's no calculation to say that we should have rangers in that area. There's no senior lead rangers and it's been diminished over the years. And I know there's a number of cards that you have, so it'd be good to hear from the public. Mm -hmm. But I think the outcome of this meeting is to ask for a study back within 60 days, so we're prepared for next year's budget, to see what the march to get a range of positions back and to have it managed well. And the adjustment between general services separation and LAPD in their role and park rangers. So mm -hmm. and so, Councilman, I would just also add to that when we're when you're drafting the motion that uh, we look at not only ranger positions but all the necessary things that go along with it, equipment, budgets, and we look at everything. Mm -hmm. Enough supervisory staff, a chief ranger, which we don't have a position today. All those different types of. Well, let me ask you a question: How many rangers do you need right now, Kevin? Mayor walks in the door right now. It depends. He on won what, the Powerball, so he's got all the money in the world. Give me a hundred. It depends on what you, what, what mm -hmm. the council would want us to do. Let me just department. say this: I, I also think that our rangers could play a critical role in our in our much used parks, Lincoln Park and MacArthur yeah. Park and Echo Park, where you have enrichment courses right. for people and young, you know, families, children who are inspired uh, when they see someone in uniform who can tell them all about the their surroundings so I wanted to also uh, let the council know that um, the committee know that um, we do have a junior ranger program in force we run it all summer long and we bring folk uh, kids from the local recreation centers putting together a really nice video 
um, to show that. And I think you guys will be happy with some of the things that the Rangers are doing out there. So you're absolutely right, Councilman. They can do, that's the uniqueness of this position. Mm -hmm. They can do everything from a, a full on arrest of, you know, uh, some type of a, a crime occurring to fighting fire to taking kids out and doing this interpretive type of to cleaning uh, up program. the area too as well they can do that you know to be honest with you councilman they don't do much of that and that's going to be a little bit of a cultural change for them however the current uh job specification for park ranger includes all of that it includes all yeah, of. Yeah, but that. if they see trash i want to pick up i don't want to see anybody leaving trash in the area right. that's a big big issue with me and everybody. Well, I think we can certainly work toward we can certainly work towards that. Yeah. However, and do you um, have a you have a ranger reserve program? We have a ranger volunteer program. Not like LAPD reserves. No, we don't. But, but we could but, have one, right? Well, it goes back to the infrastructure to be able to run reserve rangers that are going to have those types of authorities like LAPD reserves have. We would need a supervisory infrastructure in place that we do not have today. Mm -hmm. We do not have a supervisory. They're, they're just uh, gone. It's been piecemealed away. Could we ask then that you uh, incorporate that into your report in 60 days on what that would look like, what that framework would yeah. cost, what it would look like? And lastly, I just want to say, you know, Los Angeles is so unique. We have Griffith Park and we have these regional parks. There really isn't another model across the country that has what we, the resource that we have, and we just don't necessarily treat it as, as the unique resource that it is. And to do that appropriately, we need more rangers. Um, and, and having said that, Mr. Cedillo, Mr. Price? And just one thing I did want to ask before, I'm sorry, Gilbert. Uh, the uh, other issue you mentioned, too, about the reserve rangers, volunteer rangers, junior rangers, connecting with other rangers, Santa Monica Mountain Conservancy rangers, and the Angeles National Forest rangers. The Angeles National Forest is the busiest uh, uh, national forest in the country. And to connect to them in a variety of ways only enhance the the park experience so i think it's we, we totally agree with you councilman thank you so i apologize for coming in late so what would you say is your mission for the department of recreation and parks as a whole and and, and the role in the in the mission for the rangers uh, well the mission for the entire department of recreation and parks is to provide quality recreational programming and, and safe, um, uh, well-maintained facilities, park facilities across the city for all residents of the city of Los Angeles. The role and mission for the park rangers is uh, a public safety role in many ways, um, as well as a recreational role. So I see, I see the role of the park rangers as much uh, on a recreational basis as I do see their public safety function. And that's the uniqueness of the position is that these individuals are trained to do all of these different tasks. Uh, once again, uh, in, case I, in case I didn't mention it before, park rangers, uh, by their job specification and training, are sworn peace officers in the state of California. Most they trained. go through police academy. Uh, they also go through firefighting training and a, and, a, and a wildland fire academy. They have firefighting equipment. We have fire, uh, two fire engines and two what they call brush trucks. Though Actually, um, those are on patrol in Elysian as well as Griffith for the firefighting. Okay. And then we do have uh, training in, 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 in uh, na nature and interpretive skills, wildlife management. So when there's uh, coyotes, um, you know, problems in Griffith Park, it's the rangers that go out and deal with it. If there's uh, uh, nature hikes, it's the rangers that give those hikes and talks and et cetera. They can do a lot of uh, hiker safety. Hikers get up on, um, they also do, like they can do cliff rescues and search and rescue. Hikers get up on a cliff, they can't get themselves down. The rangers are trained and have all the equipment to go down on ropes, you know, lower these folks down. And they also can do a number of different medical calls. Many of the rangers are EMT qualified, and it is not required of the job spec, but it is um, highly desired. So um, all in all, the rangers do everything uh, from a public safety standpoint that we would need done in the park system. There's just very few of them and really not enough to go around. So we have a hard time even covering our shifts. And any given time in the city, we may only have two to three rangers on duty, and those are primarily in Griffith Park. So, so that was my question. So, if you've gone from 75 to 17, you've had an 80 percent reduction in your workforce over so the how years. So, how do you, how do you then fulfill your mission? I mean, how do you, 
what happens to, to the areas, the 80 percent that was, if we had a hot 75 and we covered everything, right? then now we're leaving 80 percent uncovered. How do we fulfill that? What's the priorities? How do you deal with that? Right. So uh, once again, so the Los Angeles Police Department is the primary uh, law enforcement agency for all public parks within the city of Los Angeles. So LAPD handles law enforcement. But I think it goes back to what uh, Councilmember O'Farrell said when he said that, you know, you may have uh, law enforcement officers come into the park on a response basis, but you don't have someone there every day, someone who knows every trail, who knows uh, the, the patterns of crime that are happening, who knows in some cases the residents and can make those contacts. You know, it's kind of that. The park ranger is a specialized policing. It's a very different function than what LAPD does. However, LAPD will handle the crime in the parks and they'll be there when we need them. So that's how that's covered. And of course, LA Fire Department handles all the firefighting in those parks. If we had rangers there, let's say in the 10 regional parks with fire apparatus, it might mean that you get to a fire just that much faster. Um, however, when LA Fire Department gets there, they're going to do a fantastic job, and they always come. So those parks are covered for firefighting and policing by LAPD and LAFD. All the other duties that the uh, rangers do in terms of the interpretive nature program, outreach, stuff like that, that's just not, it's just not happening. So. Let me okay. mm -hmm. Mr. Price. You know, in, um, uh, in addition to Griffith Park and, and some of the other well-known uh, open spaces. I don't think so. Uh, there are a number of other local parks, as you know. In the, in the ninth, for example, the wetlands. Uh, two projects, actually. Right. And... Uh, Again, I'm, I'm, I'm sensing from your comments that uh, those parks are also understaffed, woefully understaffed. Uh, and I think my question is, how can we encourage, I don't know, more volunteers or more uh, maybe organizations to maybe step in? Uh, you know, what kind of partnering could we do to, one, uh, increase the, the pool of, of potential um, uh, guards or, or watchmen or guides, if you will, to, to help folks navigate through these resources, because they, you know, we create them and they just sort of <clears throat> sit there, um, and it's just a real disservice to everybody. So that's a great question, Councilman, and I think that uh, Recre the Department of Recreation and Parks is attempting to address exactly uh, your point by our creation of a partnerships division in which we're focusing directly on we have a, a division, you know, it's a small, be it small division, a, a, a group of people that are focusing on developing partnerships. Um, I'll, I'll answer it in two ways. If we're just looking at parks uh, within the city, like the wetlands, for example, one of the best ways to get docent type of volunteers to lead hikes or to close gates or just to be there to answer questions is to partner with a friends group, you know, and so that takes a little bit of work, and that's something that our partnerships division can do. Many times we do that in conjunction with local community members, neighborhood council, or the council office. There may be an interest, a particular interest, so we target that facility and create a friends group and move forward in that way. Um, if we're looking at, say, a ranger a program, park ranger program, um, there's a lot we could do with developing volunteerism and reserve type of duties and the, you know, rangers or reserve is like an officer that comes through, gets all the training but doesn't get a paycheck. They come and volunteer their time so many right. days per month, like with the LAPD reserves. Um, so we could certainly do a, uh, create a program like that, but as I was mentioning, Council Member Labange, to create a program like that, you have to have a lot of oversight. So um, you have to have enough good rain, rain, park ranger infrastructure in place to be able to monitor their programs. Because today, uh, Council Member Labonge, in all honesty, has asked me to create a ranger reserve program before, and I've told him I can't do it. With these numbers, I have no one to, to monitor it. We were looking at creating a volunteer uh, wildland firefighting uh, unit within the rangers. However, you know, it takes a lot to oversee that. Interestingly enough, most fire departments across the nation are volunteer fire departments. We, I took it for granted because we have such a great fire department here. I thought every city had a fire department like that, but they don't. You know, many smaller cities have volunteers. So it's a great opportunity, and we can do it on a case-by-case -case basis. If we had more rangers, we could do a lot more of the ranger type of volunteering as well with docent programs and nature guides and things like that. So. 
Okay. So what about public-private partnerships and, and the foundation philanthropic world? Well, we, uh, uh, Council Member, we're very, Department of Recreation and Parks is very open to any type of partnerships or, or joint ventures. We do, have, uh, we do have the LA Parks Foundation that we work with. We also have our partnerships division. I'll just be honest with you. We search for very meaningful partnerships quite often. And a lot of times what we find is that folks come to the table with good intentions and maybe not enough ability to really work it out. Or sometimes they come looking to try to benefit from the public park space and not really give back to the community. So our job is to just keep, you know, keep looking and keep developing. And we do have a number of partnerships and, and are always open to, to more uh, in the community. So I guess that's it. Okay, so uh, Mr. Regan, if you we come back uh, in 60 days, uh, report on the priorities for managed hiring and or whatever category gives us the authority to bring aboard more um, more rangers, and then uh, an analysis of where the needs are the most apparent, whether it's uh, one of the you know some of the regional parks or even some of the local but highly utilized parks. Uh, wherever in the city and then a, a, and along with that a detailed report on what it was like when we had 70 um, Rangers and the day-to-day -day of what that era was like in the services and amenities they provided to what we have now uh, which would dig deeper into mr. Cedillo's question uh, those three elements would be great to hear back from and we'll also instruct the CEO's office uh, to work with uh, Rec and Parks on on this report back to the committee Absolutely. We're happy to do it, Councilman. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, just and a second, Mitch. Just one thing. Sure. Do it regionally, too. So say if you look at all your southern parks from uh, Ken Mallory all the way up, you have this new facility at Hanson, mm -hmm. East Valley, West Valley, Griffith, Elysian. So you could put your hands around it, Kevin. <laughs> and come back, like, pretend you're what the police department did. They took 20 years to get 10,000. So get a number that you think, and then we just march to that beat to get it with the combination efforts, because uh, it's a, a big, challenging job. But such an important ambassador is that of a ranger, wherever he or she may be, when they're in our parks. Thank you. Thank you. And with Thank that, you. we have uh, uh, some comic cards and on this item. And first, we have uh, Mr. Crosby Doe, and then Fran Reichenbach. Hi, I'm, I'm Crosby Doe. Thank you, uh, honorable council members, for the opportunity to speak on, on this issue of um, investigating more park rangers. And I want to let you know that uh, I am very much uh, supporting and advocating the concept of, of more uh, park rangers. And I want to bring a personal uh, perspective to, to the necessity um, I've been a 30-year resident of Hollywood land and happen to live contiguous or directly across the street from uh, Griffith Park um, at an area um, where there's, uh, which has now popularly become the place to go to see the Hollywood sign. And with that 30-year perspective, I'd like to say first and foremost that um, I, w I would request that the study incorporate mitigations, um, especially in regard to Griffith Park of the western portion being wide open and not closed at nighttime as the eastern area is. This has created a problem um, where the current situation is. If, if there, and there's regular activity, I could call the police department. First of all, I called uh, Griffith Park, and the ranger said, well, we can't handle anything. Call the police department. Well, that'll be in that particular location um, probably 20 minutes to two hours before the police will come. And obviously, the activities there, they come and go. There's noise and disturbances and all kinds of activities happening at night in a completely unsupervised open area of the park that is supposed to be closed. So I think it's critically important that your study investigate those problems and also whether perhaps uh, fencing and gating the areas uh, might mitigate that uh, versus having more rangers. But I certainly do support the idea of more rangers. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 
Ms. Reichenbach. Hi, my name is Fran Reichenbach. I'm the pre president of Beechwood Canyon Neighborhood Association, 28-year resident of Hollywood Land and Beechwood Canyon, you know. Um, the, uh, the amount of tourism we get up there, and you already know this story, and they smoke a lot, and um, we feel real vulnerable because we're surrounded by parkland. We love that, but we do feel more vulnerable. And so while you are saying that you want this study done in 60 days, if um, the study were to focus on, first of all, that area, and maybe the second round of studies focus on, a, on other regional parks and other areas peripheral to that, you might be hitting the need fast for an area that's really being um, uh, put upon right now by overabundance of folks. And maybe we'll get this done and, and have things resolved. Uh, maybe some allocated funding for, for uh, rangers, an increased no, couple of rangers before the next summer so that we can feel a little bit more comfortable. Um, and that was uh, one thing that I think, Tom, you mentioned that, uh, about not having like one senior um, ranger. Well, we do have one. He's our favorite ranger, Pete. You know him, Pete Stair. Um, this fellow um, is our only resource, and he is spread really thin. He goes all the way over to Los Feliz, and he can't be every place at once. And we know that we get general services or somebody coming by and locking gates once in a while. But, um, but he's our boots on the ground. We all carry his cell phone number. Um, he would be a resource for you if you were to... Um, consult with him about, you know, what is needed, where the hot spots are, mm -hmm. and uh, who he needs to help him. He but I appreciate that you're doing this. You Thank bet. You. Thank you. Thank you so much, Fran. Thank you. Uh, next we have uh, George Abrams, uh, followed by uh, Jerry Hans. Yeah, George Abrahams, Beachwood Canyon Neighborhood Association, resident of Hollywood Land since 1959. I grew up in the area. Uh, we have uh, three problem hot spots, Lake Hollywood Park, Deronda Drive, and Beachwood Drive. Uh, this is my wish list. We should have one full-time ranger on the weekdays during daylight hours. We should have one and a half rangers on weekends and holidays so they overlap and double coverage during the midday time. Uh, uh, at night time, we need a patrol, a ranger patrol, equipped with thermal imaging uh, equipment so we can root out the transients. They present a fire danger and also a crime problem to us. Uh, uh, one thing we could do, I mean, current price, you mentioned uh, volunteerism. Uh, what they did in Malibu is that they were found a way legally to have residents issue parking tickets and so if they can do it, it must be legal, and I think we could do it too. It's also a revenue booster. Maybe help pay for the rangers if we did it that way. Also to assign to the uh, residents the authority to lock the gates, and also we do need a better gate system. People come up there and routinely cut the bolts and all this kind of stuff, so we, could, we need a more secure gate. So that's my request. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Abrams. Hi, I'm Jerry Hans. I'm president of Friends of Griffith Park, and we're very much in support of the study, and we're also in support of more rangers. <clears throat> and as far back as the first consolidation with OPS, we've been sending scores of letters uh, regarding the, the need for more rangers. And we've also specifically advocated why rangers are a much better choice for our regional parks than security officers or police officers. Uh, the reason, rangers are generalists and uh, they provide much more than just the security aspect for our parks. In Griffith Park, they do a great job. I don't want to be redundant to Kevin, but I've seen them perform many of those tasks firsthand, including uh, brush fire patrol and fighting. Uh, Johnny on the, spot, on the spot is important in that case. Uh, medical emergencies, I've seen bicyclists down, bicyclists down recently, search and rescue. And the rangers are the ones that coordinate bringing in LAPD and the fire department uh, because usually they're the first responders. Um, rangers do animal emergencies. Uh, recently, two rattlers were removed from uh, the border of Griffith Park to interior area. And um, rangers um, pick up trash from time to time. They, they also are very involved with maintenance. Uh, they take care of signs. They take care of gates. And they help us with uh, graffiti removal uh, 
projects. Um, but more than anything, we need rangers uh, to, to give uh, more visibility and where they can be more proactive, uh, just like rangers are in the national parks. Uh, I do agree um, that um, there's definitely a new need for rangers because of the tourism that has been much on the increase. Uh, to sum it up, rangers are our best value, and not having enough of them costs us more in the long run. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hans. And we have, lastly, Mary nice. Button. Yeah. Hi, my name is Mary Button, and I'm a director on the Friends of Griffith Park. Um, I, I'll be brief because I support what mostly everybody else has said previously, advocating the need for more rangers. Um, I spend several hours each week in the park uh, enjoying the beauty and nature while I, while I hike and I bicycle, and I've noticed that there are increasingly enough more people using the park. Um, I also participate in a lot of cleanup projects in the park where we remove graffiti and pick up trash. And again, with more people using the park, there's more graffiti in the park now. I think, uh, as Mr. Reagan said, rangers are very valuable. Uh, they perform a variety of tasks. They're highly skilled in many areas, and their presence uh, would be a deterrent to having a lot of this graffiti and some of the problems that we are now experiencing. I know it's a cliche, but the park rangers truly are the eyes and ears of the park. In recent years, there have been the increasing number of people that are visiting the park. However, in the safety and health of both these people and the park, we need to not only keep the rangers present, but also significantly increase their numbers. And I'm speaking not only of Griffith Park, but all of our regional parks. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Button. Thank you so much. <coughs> Uh, and all, with that, uh, we will now move on to item number one. Can I just add one thing, just oh. so they know there, the expectation? I have trouble fencing things because of wildlife. There's a lot of wildlife up there. And also, you have public gates. And for the benefit of the uh, committee here, Griffith Park, originally 1896, was basically straight up Western Avenue. And this is the 90th anniversary of Hollywood Land, which some of these people live in Hollywood Land. And the, some of that land came about as it was not developable, so they gave it to the city. Also, we've championed the, uh, along with you, Mitch, and uh, Gil, when you're in the state, and uh, Senator Price, when you're in the state, the acquisition of Coinga Peak. And as I told some of your neighbors, I didn't buy it for you to look at. I buy it for people to hike on and do that. And more people are using the park, and there's a conflict between the high intensity of people using the park and the lack of parking in this western section of the park, uh, which is difficult to, and we're trying to manage it in all ways. Because right now, there's many people who are tourists who find that vista spot underneath your home, Mr. Doe, but the same level right below are many people who live in the area who take their dogs to Lake Hollywood Park. And you can't decipher from someone from Paris, Texas, Paris, California, or Paris, France. It's a public space, but to manage it, putting cameras up possibly, uh, working in an area, and trying to get more rangers so there's someone that could be assigned there uh, would help go a long way. But I did want to say publicly, I couldn't fence it because wildlife does go the way. And one of the ugliest scenes that, and I could only say it to you because all of you love the park so much, I was talking to a fellow from the Bureau of Sanitation and I said, what was the toughest job you had? On Mulholland, not far from where we speak of, a uh, deer mm -hmm. tried to jump and scale a fence mm -hmm. and didn't make it. Yep. And it was a wrought iron fence and it was very ugly. So I couldn't see putting a fence like we put up at Robert Burns Park at Beverly and Van Ness uh, up in your neighborhood, Mr. Doe. But I could see uh, a ranger there that we could try to get or a part-time uh, security officer like we have at the observatory because cost is a factor in this economy that we live in. And to deal with the public streets, uh, just to roll it all back, uh, it's very difficult because the public is welcome to come. It's just trying to manage it. And we're working with this and their community leadership and trying to find uh, mm -hmm. places for people to park on the edge and be able to come and enjoy the hiking trails in Lake Hollywood and other things as well. So I just wanted to state that. Thank you, Mr. LeBonge. More eyes and ears on the street. Thank you. I'm going to engineering. Thank you. Thank okay. You.
Uh, and Mr. Lid, we will hear item number one. Item number one, motion, Weezer, England, or LaBonge, relative to instructing the CAO and the CLA in conjunction with Council District 14 to report back with options and recommendations relative to possible adjustments to city regulations that will spur greater job growth and attract quality small businesses to El Pueblo and the Civic Center area. Additionally, this has been also referred to the Innovation, Technology, and General Services Committee. Thank you. And do we have anyone here from uh, our colleague, Mr. Weezer's office today? Oh, yes. Please. And we also have uh, Chris Espinosa from uh, El Pueblo. If you could come up and then we'll invite, if, if someone from the CLA and CAO, uh, we'll invite them up next. Uh, so please, welcome. Hi. I'm Sarah Hernandez, uh, the Downtown Area Director with uh, Council Member Jose Weezer. And just like the motion uh, mentioned, downtown is moving. We have 93,000 new jobs in the past 10 years, about 15.7 billion in investment in the area. And if you read the LA Business Journal today, you'll see that Bottega Louis is planning an expansion of 20,000 more square feet to put in test kitchens and bring in employee training facilities over from Glendale. So that's pretty impressive. And you'll see that their broker in this article actually comments on this and says that demand for space in downtown is so great that a major tenant is willing to lease a basement space that wasn't even on the market because demand is outstripping supply. New supply had to enter the market to satiate the demand. And so you're seeing that all over downtown. It's not just on 7th Street. It's in the Arts District. It's in South Park. It's two blocks away over on Main in the Old Bank District. Um, but you're not seeing that in certain areas of downtown as well. Mm -hmm. And specifically, those areas are areas where there is um, more city-owned property, like in El Pueblo or the Civic Center, um, the LA Mall. So that being said, we want revitalization all over downtown. And the council member, um, in order to further that vision, has submitted this motion um, asking the CAO and the CLA in uh, consultation with our office to report back on ways that we can further spur job growth and continue to promote quality businesses coming into El Pueblo and the LA Mall. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. I don't know if there's any Anything? questions or, I mean, I think one of, some of the questions that we've gotten back is how, this is a very broad motion. Um, we have made it very broad uh, and very general for a reason because we want everything to be on the table. Mm -hmm. um, we're looking at, you know, basically how does the city restructure their RFPs? What type of regulation is really stopping quality business from coming into these city-owned properties? What are the procedures? How can we better market these properties? How can we work with our outside business partners uh, to market these properties better? It is very broad, and it's very broad for a reason. So I think that that's the main question that we've gotten back so far. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you, and, and maybe we'll take some questions in a second. Uh, Mr. Espinosa, would you? Uh, Chris Espinosa, General Manager of El Pueblo Historical Monument. Uh, one of the questions that we had the other day was uh, about the South Plaza and about stimulating uh, growth within the South Plaza to augment Olvera Street. Um, Olvera Street is, uh, I'd say, about 99% leased out probably have about two spaces that we have vacant right now. One we're planning on using as another attraction, a museum uh, site, and then the other one we're holding back to allow for um, what we do is we make improvements along um, some of the older puestos and we use it as a temporary um, business site until we finish those capital improvements. So we have been targeting the uh, South Plaza area. Um, uh, we're uh, interested in working with uh, the CAO and the CLA on um, potentially securing economic development funds. Um, we've recently got the support in investing in some city funds and capital improvement projects around this, uh, uh, you know, the Merced Theater. We have a project of about $20 million that will house ITA Channel 35. Um, that's going to be a major project, and it will allow us also to look into the Pico House for potential improvements over there. Mm -hmm. and, and I think, Ms. Hernandez, you bring up a great point. It seems like the rest of downtown is happening, but at the Civic Center, we're stuck in 1975. You know, you walk across the mall, and it's a little underwhelming, and you've got the brutalist architecture that surrounds us, and it's, it just doesn't exactly scream, come visit me, this is a quality experience we can have here. And then there doesn't seem to be a connection to El Pueblo just up the street. We've got the freeway you have to cross, and so it's not the most hospitable environment uh, in order to circulate as a pedestrian or as someone who just wants to enjoy oneself downtown. Uh, to, to my knowledge, has there been 
a civic center master plan, even a streetscape master plan that ties in El Pueblo with LA Mall, for example. I'm not sure if one exists, but that could be something that we could explore. Project Restore um, completed a uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, master planning activity in 2008, uh -huh. and it's called the Historic Crossroads, and it, it speaks to making pedestrian connections and reutilizing uh, some of the empty uh, lots or uh, revitalizing par parking lots for economic development purposes. I'd love to see a copy of that. I have that, and I'll get it to you. Wonderful. All right. So nexus mm -hmm. between private sector, public sector. Nothing was more hostile to the public than Fourth and Main, and yet that was the epicenter. That's where downtown rebound took hold, and that's where from everything that's going on downtown began. So, what's the relationship? How do we figure that out? Uh, my observations are that one of the factors is that you just said residents there. And so we don't have that. And so what projects are there that seem thoughtful about uh, developing mixed-use housing? I think uh, Paseo Pasadena is one place, uh, utilizing the lots that we have. I have heard from merchants talk about us undermining their efforts around parking. Everything in L.A. is about parking. And so that uh, we don't have adequate parking spaces uh, for people who drive. Um, and that for tourist buses, I guess we're not accommodating or that we could be more accommodating uh, for tourist buses, for people who want to come in on a city tour and be dropped off, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then third is I, I just, uh, it amazes me that such uh, or tip, or, or co comparable like apples to apples historic places like the Pico House. Mm -hmm. I mean, you look at 4th and Main, the old bank district, totally fabricated, totally created, you know, Tom Gilmore has an idea. There's an old bank there. Gee, let's call this the old bank district. But we don't do the same at the Pico House or around the Chinese Museum or around uh, the other um, the fire station, et cetera. And those places could be, you know, I, mean, I, I cannot imagine why they're not right. popping and hopping. And, you know, right. you think engine company number nine, and then you, we have this fire station that's underutilized, I would say. Right. I think that's a great point. I think the Pico House is actually a perfect example. You have uh, developers that have worked very closely with Tom Gilmore that uh, have looked at the Pico House and wanted to redevelop it, and people that are knocking on our door every day asking about how, to, how can we turn this space around, you know, people that see what it can be. Um, but then you look at the reality. You look at the lease term that, uh, you know, was in that the previous RFP that we put out. You look at the amount of TI that has to go into that building. Mm -hmm. You look at the fact that there's no... I don't think there's any bathrooms, right, in the, in that no, building. It's, it's so the amount, plumbing. the amount of there work <laughs> that would need to go into that with the lease terms that you have um, currently, and the, mm -hmm. the type of city regulation that may or may not be hindering that, um, is something that we want to look into and explore a little bit better. Because what is stopping a, a merchant or a business going into a city-owned property when they can go in right across the street without the same amount of regulation, and how do we kind of how do we mitigate that and make sure that we're we're putting ourselves on equal footing and and making ourselves marketable? Well, I mean that's the key difference. Is these are private uh, properties and and we're dealing with public. The uh, historic monument, um, you know, it was it was consolidated as a state historic monument. So uh, these properties are very um, important uh, to educate the public and to preserve um, for the city as a treasure. Um, you know, I think you'll recall that there was a, a lawsuit um, that had been engaged in for over 15 years. We we recently settled that lawsuit having to do with the Pico House specifically. Uh, we we uh, settled that lawsuit um, just this past December. And so this gives us a new opportunity to look at the property in a free and open way that hadn't been done before. Uh, the Merced Theater, with the investment that we're putting in there, um, with the help of the Municipal Facilities Committee, we also designated about $100,000 in, in capital funding so that the Merced Theater is essentially a shell and we'll be rebuilding it, the whole interior with its plumbing, uh, electricity, um, fire life safety. That hundred, extra 100000 from a different funding source will be used to design the connections to the adjacent Pico House, specifically the upper two floors, um, to 
put in the type of plumbing and electricity needs needed to potentially lease out the space. So we, we are taking a very uh, strong look at, at how to get that, that property um, uh, used to its best purpose. But so, uh, yes, sir. So tell me the distinctions other than, so historic buildings are historic buildings, whether they're public or private. Everyone has to deal with CEQA. Everyone has to deal with ADA. So those distinctions don't seem to be unique to a public status or a private status. And so what are the other things that, that are the distinctions between public and private that hold back? Well, the, the major holdback was that lawsuit that had been in place for over 15 years. Um, and there were some seismic improvements made to the, to the property, but it was never completed. The, the, the other major impediment is that the whole South Plaza runs off a centralized building system. And this, build, this, this HVAC unit is really large, looks like a big submarine, mm -hmm. and, it's, and it operates all the heating and air conditioning for the South Plaza. So whenever we brought in developers to take a look um, at potentially revitalizing that property or the properties around there, it's been a major impediment. And if you look at the capital costs required to invest in that property um, versus um, what the lease term would be provided to them, they, they couldn't recapitalize on that investment. Um, but, but the fact of the matter is, is that we did have that lawsuit. We've set, since settled that lawsuit. The... HVAC system that I'm describing, uh, there may be some potential to solve that issue when we start working on the Merced Theater. Um, the Merced Theater, um, that type of, of government investment in that property will help um, change that whole South Plaza. And so I think this is like an incredible opportunity. I mean, it's $20 million. It's a um, it's cable operator tax that's going into it that can only be used for Channel 35 and only for construction. So it's a, it's a great nexus in trying to, to pull that, that property out of its current state. Then um, we can talk more about the details of that. Go ahead. Uh, Mr. President. No, I just wanted to... Uh, I just want to come. I think it's an exciting opportunity to reevaluate these properties. I think certainly, if we're serious about economic development, community economic development, you know, we got to start with city-owned properties. Uh, and and uh, as my colleague has been saying, think through, um, you know, how we make them available in, in ways that we have them before, fixing the, making the lease terms more uh, desirable, providing, you know, some assistance for TA build out, etc. So I'm excited that this is moving forward. Hopefully it will be a template for how we approach other publicly owned properties, especially as we feel about ways to really leverage the, the economic benefit that they can provide. So. Mm -hmm. And you'll answer this question when you send me the, the master plan, but did it also include the vision of the Cap Park uh, over the 101? Because I just I think if you, if you take a look at the look and feel of, of a space, I think we need to think in terms of El Pueblo and the Civic Center and the, the mall um, in, in terms of, of uh, placemaking, uh, connecting the two, so that, that it's attractive. I mean, if, if, you, if you look at the sites, uh, El Pueblo is wonderful on its own, but it's so isolated, right? If there's a way to connect the two, the Civic Center with El Pueblo, uh, with placemaking, um, and we're talking about something much more grand when we talk about a cat park over the freeway. But even without that, we could probably do a better job at our public uh, infrastructure improvements in terms of just connecting the two, lending, lending the look and feel to a better pedestrian experience, uh, which could be the government's way of signaling to investors that we're partners in this as well. Uh, and, and I just know that in my, in my own direct experience, um, the, the return on investment is pretty high when you design a, a streetscape get some funding for it and start building it out, that causes its own uh, sort of economic response. Well, in relation to that, um, the Union Station Master Plan, they're, they're um, proposing some very uh, bold uh, pedestrian connections between the uh, Union Station and into the Plaza of Pueblo. Mm -hmm. um, 
also um, what we need to take a look at is make sure that it doesn't negatively impact busing, bus parking. Mm -hmm. um, so we've been working with uh, uh, the master planners over there to see how we can continue to accommodate all the, the tourists that come. Um, we are also uh, working on a metro call project that will improve a, a, a strip of land between uh, your council district and CD14 between Spring Street and Main Street. Uh, there's a sidewalk there that's just been really, um, it's torn up, it's, it's inaccessible for ADA purposes, has large ficus that bust up the whole thing, the sidewalk. There's a, a, a tourist bu bus parking zone that's totally unused right there because of the state of condition. And it also serves an important pedestrian connection to Chinatown. If we invest that money properly, maybe move back the fence line a bit mm -hmm. and create large public walkway mm -hmm. that's clean and, and fresh, I mean, you're, you're going to have a lot better pedestrian connections uh, into, into the Chinatown. Mm -hmm. we, uh, we did that with the state when we widened on, on Main Street and put yeah. the benches and put the trees, uh, allow the shops to open up towards Main, not just towards yeah. the inside, more access. Uh, always a concern of mine, a lament, plumbing, public restrooms. Yes, sir. Uh, we had a staff retreat at the Pico House just so that we could be boosters and, and appreciate uh, the environment, but no restrooms. I mean, no plumbing. We had to take breaks and break up the, you know, the, the meetings and stuff, so... Yeah, we're, we're working directly on that. Um, not only are we working on uh, restrooms in the Pico House itself, we... We are um, engaging in a capital improvement program that will renovate the, the public restrooms throughout the monument because they're in really bad condition, um, making improvements to the Italian Hall, uh, making improvements to the Avila Adobe. And I would be very happy to be able to share with you um, a whole list of uh, smaller type capital improvements that we're taking around the monument to, to improve the site. That'd be terrific. And then finally, any thoughts on, on public-private partnerships, big partners, uh, branding? Um, people would be interested in partnering with us simply to promote their brand. Yeah. Um, well, we've been, um, in the past, we've worked with Telemundo. We work with Univision. Um, you know, right now we have a, a one-week shoot on Los Angeles Street, uh, um, and they're filming a, a TV show called uh, Caso Cerrado. And it's a, a, a great revenue booster for us. Um, you know, I would love to be able to use uh, the upper floors of the Pico House for lease purposes, private lease purposes, maybe with a law firm or architecture firm, because it's kind of like boutique style um, uh, facility. Um, I don't know if you have uh, other corporate partnerships that you've been... I, I mean, we're just open to really utilizing the resources that we have in downtown. And we have a significant mm -hmm. amount of, um, of people and resources in the, in the private industry that we can utilize. I know, I mean, this isn't, has, doesn't have to do directly with El Pueblo, but we, the reflection space over underneath the old Reflections restaurant um, and in the LAPD building. The other day we had um, a broker, a downtown broker, come in with GSD and just really look at the space and give us some, you know just very off the cuff, some recommendations. And that's just the type of, of the partnership and the collaboration that we're looking for, is how do we really make this, you know, something that is, people want to put their business in. The big one we're trying to do right now is um, we're partnering with the Western National Parks Association. So they're essentially the friends of the national parks, uh, been created by Congress 75 years ago. They want to partner with us to create a visitor center in the Helmand Kwan the Helmand Kwan building is right across the way from where you were at in the Pico House, in that brick building on the yes. corner of Sanchez. Um, they would hire five people, uh, promote El Pueblo, promote the national parks, and kind of um, promote the President Obama's America's Great Outdoors initiative. Um, they're very interested in, in investing into that site, and, um, and so we've been uh, developing it and starting to brief um, the electeds and different members to support us in that effort. Um, I believe in October, the head of the National Park Service is going to come out to El Pueblo to, to give his backing. So we, you know, we're really trying to focus in on maybe some of this economic development money to close the budget gap, but um, it could be something very... Um, you know, an important partnership that, that uh, we can do over at El Pueblo. Wonderful. 
Well, thank you. And uh, what I'll, I would like to instruct the CEO and the CLA to work with El, El Pueblo on ideas uh, that tie what you're doing and with the possible improvements at the, uh, at the LA Mall and Civic Center as well, and report back within 60 days. Thank you. Terrific. Thank you so much. And do we have representatives from the CLA and CEO? Good afternoon, Clay McCarter with the CLA's office, and we will work with the council office in El Pueblo and bring back a report. Terrific. Good afternoon. <clears throat> Josh Romer with the CAO's office. Um, uh, much like our colleagues at the CLA, we're, we definitely see the opportunities here. We're very interested in working with, uh, with our colleagues and CD14 and El Pueblo. Um, I did want to just inform the um, inform the committee that there are, uh, are already some things uh, in progress. Uh, some of them have already been mentioned in the unionization master plan. Mm -hmm. We've had initial conversations with that team, and they do have some very interesting ideas with how to really improve the connections, not only from Union Station to El Pueblo, but beyond over the LA Mall and Civic Center. So we think that really keying in on those could, could make a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. um, in addition, the, the PA Consulting has been engaged by the CAO's office and working with the CLA mm -hmm. over the last few months to basically give us an overview of best practices in um, uh, leasing for civic properties uh, to make some recommendations on how GSD could basically do a better job. Um, they haven't necessarily had the resources in the past to be able to lease out city facilities uh, in a way that we think is, is optimal. Uh, so that, that consultant study is already in process. Within the next few months, we uh, expect to have deliverables. And there is one particular deliverable specifically on the LA Mall. Uh, in order to give the city some recommendations for how to move forward, recognizing that the facility is not optimally used. Mm -hmm. So we expect in the next few months to be able to come back with um, a very specific set of recommendations for the LA Mall. Okay. Do you think uh, they could be part of that 60-day report? Uh, I think that we, we could definitely strive to include within 60 uh -huh. days. Uh, I'm not completely sure with the, the time frame of the deliverables. The whole PA consulting package has a lot of deliverables. I know that we'll be getting a draft of the LA Mall uh, this month. Okay. Uh, you'll at least have the draft? Yes. Okay. That, that could be reportable. Great. Any, anything to add? No, nothing further. Mm. All right. Uh, yeah, we're aware that this issue has been pending for a while. Uh, so I, I appreciate you all coming in and uh, sort of giving us an update and we look forward to, to hearing what you have to come back with in 60 days and, of course, working with Council Member Wizar's office and Ms. Hernandez. Uh, and we look forward to uh, what we can do. Any questions? Thank you. No, I'm good. Yep. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, and seeing as there are no additional comment cards. So will we hold this in committee? Continue yes. Up pending Please. Mm -hmm. um, additionally, Mr. Chair, at this time when we consented items three through six, we only had two members present. Um, oh, okay. Can we perhaps get a concurrence from the third member? Okay. Yes. Okay. Yep. So, make so move. So concur. Great. We are good. Thank you so much. Uh, this committee is uh, adjourned. Thank you.